Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so very much for watching and downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making this one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. My guest today is a return guest. His new book, Can Fasting Save Your Life? Back in the topic of conversation today, a follow-up with Dr. Alan Goldhammer. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Great to get you face to face in Cleveland here at the National Health Association Conference, no less. And I'll tell you, we got so much great feedback from your initial appearance on the show. We have a ton of follow up questions about the book I would love to talk with you about today. Sure. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is we saw a lot of comments from people who say, well, water fasting seems like such an extreme thing to do in terms of tackling your weight issues. Uh, on the surface, you take all the food off the table for a little while. It does sound a little bit extreme. So talk to us about the mentality of somebody who thinks that this is a really extreme route to take when it comes to conquering their health. They say that fasting is radical, and it is, because radical uh, comes from the term that means root or cause. So it is a you know an attempt to deal with the root or cause of the reason why people are becoming overweight to begin with. Yeah. And one of the problems with people today is that they're getting their satiety mechanisms fooled. So the normal thing that keeps people from becoming overweight is that when they're eating whole natural foods and they get to a certain point, their brain signals them they've had enough. But when we use highly processed refined carbohydrates and animal foods, the brain can be fooled. And so people will consistently eat more than they need in order to maintain optimum weight. And so they gain weight. Right. And of that fat, some of it's something called visceral fat. Visceral fat is the type of fat that tends to accumulate around the belly and the organs. And it behaves differently than regular adipose tissue in that it produces inflammation and inflammatory products. And those inflammatory products lead to very specific diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease, and some forms of cancer, including lymphoma. And as a consequence, people, large numbers of people that are becoming overweight is what 72 percent of the population are now overweight or obese have lots of fat and lots of visceral fat and lots of inflammation and they're getting these diseases and it's interesting because people treat these diseases as if they're completely separate unrelated entities in fact you have to go to different doctors even to be evaluated and treated for these different seemingly unrelated diseases when in reality they all have a common contributing cause and that's the dietary excess that leads to the fat that leads to the visceral fat that leads to the inflammation that causes the disease right so that's that radical part the root cause um let's let's talk about this a little bit i, I want to dive into visceral fat so basically what you're saying is the fat that accumulates around the abdomen in that belly area you think about a guy maybe a beer belly would that be a good example of visceral fat Good example of a person that's likely to have a lot of visceral fat. Right, right. And so that fat, it acts differently in the body than, say, the fat that would accumulate in a person's neck, on their arms, their legs. That's just, it's a different kind of a beast. Is that kind of what you're saying? It has a effect very much like a tumor. So it's hypermetabolic. It, it produces these inflammatory products. And, you know, if you said to a person, look, you have a two-pound abdominal tumor, they wouldn't be surprised to find out that that might be contributing to health compromising problems. And that's exactly what people with excess fat is. They have uh, a tumor that's producing inflammatory products. That tumor is visceral fat. And let's go back to that extreme part. Um, you, again, you take food off the table. A person's worried about, well, I'm not gonna get enough nutrients. I'm not gonna be getting the calories, the nutrients, the vitamins that my body needs. That part does seem extreme. and. Uh, I guess then a water fast, especially a prolonged one, isn't necessarily something somebody should be attempting to do on their own, correct? Well, there's certain things that have to be done before water fasting can be done safely. Number one, you have to make sure a person's a good candidate for fasting. Right. And part of that is that they have um, adequate baseline uh, nutrient reserves. And so the way that you determine if a person is a good candidate is first by their medical history mm -hmm. with a physical exam and some basic laboratory testing. Right. So that definitely needs to be done in conjunction with the patient's physician or at a facility like the True North Health Center that specializes in medically supervised water only fasting. And then there's some things that have to be done when a person's fasting, regardless of where they're doing the fasting, whether it's in a facility or if it's at home, is they have to make sure that they have appropriate rest, they make, need to make sure they maintain hydration, 
And uh, also critical is that you need to make sure when it comes time to refeed that that refeeding process be done appropriately. Too rapid a refeeding can result in very se potentially serious problems, including refeeding syndrome or post-fasting edema, problems that can be very serious. So you don't want to take a person that's gone through fasting and then not appropriately refeed. Proper refeeding is perhaps one of the most important parts of the fast. And it's also when people get used to eating the whole plant food SOS free diet that's going to be necessary to sustain the results that they've achieved during fasting. What is refeeding syndrome? That's a new one to me. If a person goes through um, any kind of deprivation, for example, in World War II when they liberated uh, prison war camps, they didn't understand this fully and so they would rapidly refeed people and they could get a, a, a imbalance of their electrolyte systems that can cause cardiac. Uh, shut down and other problems. Um, you can, uh, people that have been, um, go, they go through fasting, if you introduce them too rapidly, for example, to a high sodium intake, they can retain fluid, get, get refeeding, you know, um, uh, post fasting edema, so which cause swelling and other problems. Right, right. So it's just when the body goes through fasting, an important part of it is that proper realimentation. For example, when a person goes through, say, a 20 day water only fast, it'll take 10 days, about half the length of the fast to carefully and slowly realignment them so that they're back to eating a whole plant food SOS free diet. You know, that kind of makes me think of like all the regular di regular diets that people go on and they say, well, look, you know, I'm gonna do really well. I'm gonna lose these 20 pounds and then I'm gonna go to DQ. I'm gonna get the biggest blizzard that I possibly can. Does that really kind of put the body into kind of a pseudo type of a shock? Most of the criticisms that you hear about weight loss programs is the is the yo-yo type response. Um, fasting, when it's done properly, is unique in that regard. Uh, the body composition does change, and it changes very specifically. In fact, we've done a study uh, that looks at body composition changes before and after fasting and on follow-up and shows what actually happens. And essentially what happens when you fast is you lose a bunch of weight. Right. Some of that weight is water and fiber, glycogen, protein, and fat. And then when you come off the fast, you regain weight. For example, you'll put a, a water back in the system as you rehydrate. You'll put glycogen back, maybe as much as two pounds of glycogen back in the muscles. You'll uh, put fiber back into the intestinal tract. You'll, so you'll regain lean tissue. And you also, uh, but you don't regain fat. So what's interesting is the body weight would come down and then the body weight would come back up. So if a person, say, lost 20 pounds, they might regain 10 pounds. But the, the, when you look at what is the weight they're regaining, it's water, fiber, glycogen, and protein. The fat continues to come down. And what's even more impressive is that not only does the fat come down, but visceral fat is preferentially mobilized and returned. And so what happens is a person that, say for example, lose uh, fasts for two weeks, that might lose 10% of their body weight. Uh, when they recover, uh, their, uh, and 10% of the body may, might be, uh, 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 when they recover, the weight that they're regaining is water, fiber, glycogen, and protein. It's not fat. Right. And so the person that lost 10% of their body weight may lose 20% of their fat and as much as 40% of their total visceral fat. So just like when a person goes in a fast and has, a, say, a breast tumor, the, they lose 10% of their body fat. They don't necessarily lose 10% of their tumor weight. They may lose 20% or 50% uh -huh. or even all of their tumor because the body mobilizes tissues in inverse proportion to its needs. So there's a, an intelligence the body has at how it chooses which tissue to break down during fasting. So you mentioned that there's a lot of testing that a person needs to go through uh, before they go ahead and attempt this. Uh, I know that I believe people can log on to your website or give uh, True North a call to figure out whether or not they'd be a good candidate. And I know that there's also some resources in the book. So, yeah, the book goes through it in exquisite detail. So not only would a patient understand, but the information there that their physician would need to understand in order to guide them through it is all present in the book. And we also offer a free service where as a person that was interested, is this something that might be appropriate for them? They can go onto our website, truenorthhealth.com, complete what are called the registration forms, which gets us their medical history. And then we offer a free phone conversation so a person can discuss whether this would be appropriate for them. And we'll try to hook them up either with the doctor through the telemedicine practice or remotely uh, that can be of some support to them in going through the process. It's not something somebody wants to do on their own because they first need to make sure that they're a candidate. For example, people on medications, you can't just arbitrarily discontinue many types of medications right. and you don't fast on medications. So you have to figure out a strategy to safely and appropriately wean medications or modify the protocol so that it can be adapted to an individual, for example, that has, for example, medications that they're not able to discontinue.
Sure. All right. Well, we have some follow-up questions from your last appearance on the show, if you're up for them. Absolutely. All right. First question is from somebody who may have struggled a little bit with the water fast at first. They said, I did a 24-hour water fast and ended up with gallstones, and I've never had any in my life. Uh, they also said that they've been whole food plant-based for close to a decade. After that, they got a little bit scared. Uh, learned that fasting was hard, not necessarily for everybody. So, um, when somebody does something as radical as a water fast, can the body produce gallstones and what might cause that? Well, what really is going on there is you don't form gallstones in 24 hours. That takes uh, months or, or even years in order to form uh, gallstones. So it's not that uh, you have a person without gallstones and now they suddenly form gallstones in a matter of a few hours. What happens though is during fasting, the body will rapidly mobilize and eliminate many materials. And if there are a gallstone, sometimes your body will will flush those and it can be a very intense uh, process. Same thing with kidney stones. You're not gonna form kidney stones in a 24 hour period, but you can certainly pass things that are there. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, intense mobilization and elimination of materials from the body that can occur during fasting. It can be a very intense uh, process. Um, I remember a few years ago, this exam room, writes, uh, reading uh, in Japan that Japanese people lost a lot of weight and then got sick because chemicals were present in their fat and then freed up when they entered their blood. Is this something that you've talked about? It seems like we're kind of hinting on that as well, just the elimination of toxins and initially your body's just going to kind of freak out and have that sick response. Yeah, in fact, there's pr pretty good literature showing that during fasting, the body mobilizes and eliminates some of these accumulated intermediary products and metabolism as well as toxic products products, PCB, docs, and other particularly fat-based um, uh, molecules. And, you know, there are some people that say, oh, fasting does such a good job of mobilizing these toxins, you shouldn't do it unless you take their proprietary products. Then apparently it changes the safety <laughs> protocol. But again, we've in our book, Can Fasting Save Your Life, we uh, uh, talk about one of the safety studies that we did where we talked about all the adverse events that can occur, uh, what happens during fasting. And, and it's absolutely clear when it's done in appropriately selected patients and it's done according to protocol, it can be a very safe and effective process of giving the body a chance to kind of do what it do, does best, which is really try to heal itself. And so yes, materials are mobilized during fasting and they can present interesting symptoms. When you look at the long-term and follow-up, you find that it can be done quite safely. Uh, Daisy has a follow-up to that follow-up even. Uh, she says, look, I just started a plant-based diet and I feel exhausted. Is withdrawal from all of these standard American diet type of foods uh, something that could cause a person's energy to plummet? Or she wants to know, am I just doing this wrong? Well, actually it can be one or both. Uh, the uh, energy is diverted during fasting to deep mobilization and detoxification. Um, also, your body goes into a conservation mode during fasting. Um, uh, in the sense that now your, your, your brain is saying, okay, we're not getting any nutrition, we have to make an adaption. And that adapt, ad adaptation is essentially what fasting is, changing the brain, which is our primary burner of fuel, from burning its normal fuel, which is glucose, to burning fat, particularly ketones or beta-hydroxybutyric acid specifically. So as the brain changes fuel, uh, energy uh, and metabolism slows and the body adapts to this uh, period of fasting. Uh, what's interesting though is that uh, me metabolic uh, function begins to return as people recover. So mm -hmm. by the time people have been feeding for the length of the fasting, their metabolic rate and other variables have been normalized. So it's not a, a persistent uh, change, it's an adaptive change during fasting. So yes, during fasting or radical dietary change where you're you're losing weight, you're going through these processes, right. uh, energy can definitely come down. But overall, uh, energy uh, and function tend to improve. In fact, it's interesting because we've looked at this uh, in studies, one of the conditions that we treat uh, are long COVID where fatigue and brain fog and other things are you know, uh, a predominant persistent problem. And then fasting, those problems can actually be reversed. In fact, we've got uh, our first uh, long COVID long-term you know, follow-up study that's been published. And you know, it shows that uh, that fatigue, which is such a dominant factor of uh, persistent uh, post-infection syndrome does resolve during fasting. Uh, with the patients who were featured in that study, were they a lot of people who, when they initially got COVID, had a lot of comorbidities, or were these people who were already eating a healthier diet? So this this first paper is actually a case report, so it's an individual. And so in this particular uh, case, it was a 72-year-old who happened to develop uh, uh, post, you know, long COVID syndrome. He had been uh, actively uh, dealing with these problems for over two years. 
uh, underwent fasting, had rapid res resolution with long-term follow-up. Amazing, amazing to me. Um, let's see here. Uh, Polly, this is an interesting question. Uh, probably somebody that's not eating a plant-based diet. As I understand it, she says, uh, vegans eat as often as they are hungry. So it's very often in Polly's opinion. Do you have any advice for people who fast in terms of dealing with hunger initially? You know, one of the great things about fasting is there's this neuroadaptation that happens. So sometimes when people are on a traditional diet, lots of animal foods and processed foods, and they, you try to get them to eat healthy foods, fruits and vegetables, it's disgusting, tasteless slim, they, sli, uh, slime. They can't really adapt to it because they're addicted to the artificial stimulation of dopamine and other materials in the brain consequent to their highly processed uh, diet. Um, after fasting, for example, We've published a study, it looks at taste neuroadaptation, that pa patients' uh, response to salt and sugar, their taste sensitivity actually changes during fasting and hedonic response to highly processed food changes so that good foods start to taste better. One of the great benefits of fasting is that after fasting, good foods start to taste well. Yeah. And it's easier to get people to eat healthy foods once they've gotten out of that pleasure trap. I've heard people say it can take three weeks for a person's taste buds to change, sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter. In your experience, what is that time range? Well, there's actually a literature on that. We know that, for example, with sodium, it takes people on average about a month to neuroadapt to a low salt diet. With a low fat diet, what's interesting is it takes as much as three months. Wow. So for three months, people don't feel satisfied when they're eating a healthy diet that's lower in fat, uh, low in sodium, et cetera. But if you eat the diet long enough, eventually it comes around, but it's hard to get people to eat well for a month or three months. After fasting, that change happens very rapidly. Yeah. And so now good foods taste good. And so it's a useful tool at helping people escape the dietary pleasure trap and get back into eating a whole plant foods diet, which is really the long-term ultimate solution to many of these problems. All right, final question, a little bit different. It's not a, a chronic disease that we, we have been talking about. It's not diabetes, it's not high cholesterol, high blood pressure, anything like that. This particular person is wondering about atrial fibrillation and if you've seen any patients who you've worked with in uh, your practice who have gone through the fasting experience and then seen their heart begin to beat in regular rhythm. So atrial fibrillation is a serious problem and particularly because it's normally treated with anticoagulant drugs. And you can't just arbitrarily discontinue our, uh, anticoagulant drugs without uh, uh, consequent risk. And so in our practice, we don't fast people that are on anticoagulant drugs until they're stabilized off their medication. But that doesn't keep you from using diet and lifestyle modification. In, in many cases, people with atrial fibrillation that get increased cardiac perfusion may normalize over time. So you've seen just about everything from the patients who have come through your doors. We've been doing this for 40 years. We've had 25,000 people undergo water only fasting. Uh, and so far of the 25,000 people that have walked in, 25,000 people have walked out and we work real hard to maintain our safety protocol by making sure we go through history exam lab and monitoring on every patient that we treat. They keep in touch with you, some of the success stories? We do, we have good long term. In fact, I'm getting 30 and even 40 year follow up patients. Uh, now that, you know, people that we saw when they were in their uh, 40s or 50s originally, and now they're in their 80s or 90s. And the story is very much the same. They'll often say that, you know, they've outlived everybody they know. And in some cases, even their children who have grown up and, you know, died from cardiac arrest or other problems that aren't doing the diet. So it's a, a really interesting experience. I know my mom, when she was 92, she realized she'd outlived all 50 of her lifelong friends. And she said it was getting harder and harder to make new friends because even people 10 years younger were still too feeble to really engage in the activities that she liked to do. And she said, Alan, you have to warn your patients if they're going to eat this whole plant food diet, make younger friends. <laughs> Good advice. Mama knows best. Dr. Alan Goldhammer, thank you so much, my friend. Thank you.